Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pallavi Limay and I'm going to talk about the model-based approaches to clinical drug-drug interaction risk predictions and the transition between these in vitro data to the uh, traditional or full-blown PBPK modeling, uh, what models can be used. So today I will be talking about these model-based approaches and uh, the model-based approach is essentially a tool to extrapolate the in vitro data to in vivo situation. After you have obtained the in vitro data from the routine ad DDI studies for your drug candidate, the next question is its relevance to humans. Ultimately, you want to know if this drug candidate carries any clinical DDI risk. And to address this question, the regulatory agencies have made recommendations on a set of mathematical formulae or models that can be utilized before you make a decision whether a clinical DDI study is needed or a PBPK model is needed. So we at Xenotech can delve into these mathematical models uh, to provide answers for our clients to determine the need for a clinical DDI study. Here is the very first paragraph from the FDA guidance that introduces the topic of need of an in vitro study and how that information, along with the clinical information, can provide prediction about potential clinical DDI study need. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on the DDI risk models proposed by the US FDA. Such models are also recommended by EMA and PMDA. There are slight differences in the equations recommended by these three regulatory agencies. So the main types of the in vitro ADME studies that are required for predicting the in vivo clinical study uh, to determine the DDI potential are the ones that focus on the perpetrator potential. And there are three ADME DDI studies to determine the perpetrator potential. The first study is the SIP inhibition study that identifies the specific SIP enzymes inhibited by the drug candidate. Number two is SIP induction study that assesses the induction potential of the drug for specific SIP enzymes. And the third one is transporter inhibition study that assesses the inhibition potential against the major transporters. Now let's talk about the types of models that are used for this extrapolation. There are three main types, basic models, static mechanistic models, and dynamic mechanistic models. The main difference between static models and dynamic models is that the static models assume single dosing or steady state concentrations versus dynamic models, as their name suggests, deal with multiple dosings and drug concentrations that may not reach a steady state. They also incorporate overall physiology in these predictions. I'll focus on the first two models that are offered at Secure Genotech. We currently do not offer PBPK modeling. We have been working with in vitro drug interaction data and meeting the regulatory expectations for over 25 years. And with our expertise, we can provide the experience insight into these very important calculations for our sponsors. So now let's talk about various values that are determined in the basic and mechanistic static models. The values are referred to as R values, which where R stands for a ratio of some kind, which I will talk about in a bit. They are further named as R1 and R2 for hepatic SIP inhibition, depending on whether it's a direct or time-dependent inhibition. And R1 gut is for the direct intestinal uh, SIP inhibition. For SIP induction, there is R3 and relative induction score or RIS. And for transporter inhibition, it is just R for various types of major transporters. For the static mechanistic model, uh, the term is AUCR where the ratio is uh, of AUC of a victim drug with and without the perpetrator drug. 
So the next question is, how do you decide which model to use and when? To help understand this better, here is a decision tree. The very first requirement or the trigger uh, is, of course, the in vitro result obtained from the SIP inhibition, SIP induction, or transporter inhibition study. If the results um, have no indication of inhibition or induction, then there is no reason to run any modeling, and it suggests that drug is unlikely to cause a clinical DDI. However, if there is an indication that you, the drug is causing either inhibition or induction of SIP enzymes or transporters, then the first step is to run a basic static model and then determine the values for either R1, R2, R3, or RIS, and R for the transporters. And then uh, the value that you get is compared to the predetermined cutoff if the value falls within the cutoff, then it says that there is no need to conduct further modeling and the drug is unlikely to cause a clinical DDI. However, if the R value is outside of the cutoff, then the next step is to run a mechanistic static model. So the basic static models are shown here. Here are the type of data the equations for each of these uh, study types and the predetermined cutoff that show whether they have the uh, potential to cause a clinical DDI study. There is a separate set of formulae to calculate the R value of the transporter studies depending on the location and the type of transporter that you are studying. So just as an example, I'm going to discuss how using the in vitro data, R value is calculated. And I'm going to use uh, example of R1, which is for the hepatic direct SIP inhibition uh, to explain how this is calculated. So here are the typical SIP inhibition data that you obtain from the in vitro study. So here, the human liver microsomes are incubated with the test article. And in this particular example, the CYP3A4 activity is measured with zero minute pre-incubation or 30 minute pre-incubation with the test article. And as you can see here, there is a concentration dependent decline in the CYP3A4 activity. This also indicates that there is no difference in the IC50 value with and without the 30 minute pre incubation with the test articles, suggesting that this is a direct inhibition which is of reversible in nature. So, based on this, now you have obtained your IC50 value. And if the reaction is run at the K value of the substrate, then you can also further calculate the KI value by dividing IC50 by two. Uh, this is based on our publication by Hopf et al. Uh, from 2015. So here is the equation uh, for the hepatic SIP inhibition, R1. It says R1 is equal to one plus I max U over KIU. So what I max U is the unbound C max value and the KIU is the in vitro inhibition constant, which we just obtained from our in vitro study. And this is the unbound value of Ki. And the potential to inhibit is when the R1 value is either equal to or more than 1.02. So what we are going to do now is we are going to plug in this I max U, and this is the hypothetical value that I'm using and the KIU that we obtained uh, from the, the example that I showed for CYP3A4 inhibition. So I'm gonna plug in these two values and calculate the R1 value, which comes out as 3.98, which is above the cutoff of 1.02. And therefore this suggests that there is a potential to cause a clinical DDI. So because the R1 value failed the cutoff, we will be going for the next step, which is uh, determining the mechanistic static model value for AUCR. 
Now, the parameters those are needed for the static mechanistic model are much more involved than just the basic model where it only needs the IMAX U value and the KI value that we just looked at. <clears throat> Here, there are a lot more parameters and items needed, such as the fraction of metabolism of a victim drug, hepatic blood flow, uh, the blood flow through enterocytes, fraction of absorption, and so on. Uh, some of these parameters can be experimentally derived, such as the extent of binding to plasma proteins and then the blood to plasma concentration ratio. Uh, and for some, we can use the values which are given in the literature or in the guidance documents, such as the blood flow through the enterocytes or the hepatic blood flow values. When the fraction of absorption is not known, uh, we can assume that the all 100% of the drug is absorbed and the FA value will be considered as one. Um, so based on these parameters, now we will plug in those values into the equation for AUCR. As you can see here, it is a much more complex equation compared to the basic. And the one uh, beauty of this model is that if your ZIP enzyme is inhibited or induced, by the test article at the same time, uh, this equation can calculate the net effect because inhibition and induction, since they, those are the opposing effects, you want to know whether they are going to be canceled out or it will be leaning towards uh, one effect of inhibition or induction. And as you can see here, it also includes the inhibition in the gut, induction in the gut, inhibition in the liver, and induction in the liver. And the potential to cause the induction uh, that the cutoff value for AUCR is less than or equal to 0.8 versus for inhibition, if the AUCR value is equal to or above 1.25, um, we know that there is a, a possibility of a clinical DDI risk. So if the AUCR value falls within 0.8 to 1.25, that's when we can say that there is, uh, there is an unlikely risk for the clinical DDI using the drug that is in question. So as I mentioned, uh, if the static mechanistic AUCR value also fails the cutoff, then it suggests that there is a potential to cause a clinical DDI, which can be further pursued by a PBPK model or by conducting an actual clinical DDI study. So now I'm going to provide a project um, where we looked at the both basic model as well as the mechanistic static model and figured out if the drug had a um, risk of clinical DDI. So in this example, the test article was an inhibitor of CYP2B6. Efavirenz was the substrate that was used to study CYP inhibition. So based on this, then the R1 value, which is for the basic model of hepatic direct inhibition was calculated. And that was 2.51, which is above the predetermined cutoff of 1.02 and suggested that it does have a clinical risk of um, SIP inhibition, SIP to be SIP, to be six inhibition, uh, to be specific. So the in vitro data from the SIP induction study suggested that, in fact, this test article also induced SIP to be six within all three uh, hepatocyte cultures. Those were tested, and the R three values for the basic model were around 0.7 or 0.6 which fell below the 0.8 cutoff. And therefore, um, the conclusion was that this test article also has a potential to cause an induction of CYP2B6. Now, uh, because of this, we further pursued it with the mechanistic static model and calculated the AUCR value. The AUCR value, in fact, uh, fell between uh, 0.8 and 1.25, the cutoff for induction and the cutoff for inhibition. And therefore, it was suggesting that, in fact, 
the induction and inhibition effect was uh, sort of canceling each other out. And based on this, we concluded that CYP2B6 was not predicted to be affected by the drug to a clinically significant extent. In addition, we also calculated, we were able to calculate the critical Cmax plasma concentration that will be needed to show that induction or inhibition effect. And that was found to be 115 times greater than the observed Cmax in patients before AUCR values will fall between this cutoff of 0.8 to 1.25. So these strategies definitely are very helpful um, and they help with conserving the resources and the manpower that will be needed for the actual clinical DDI study or even to generate a uh, very extensive PBPK model. So to summarize, uh, what we have uh, shown here is that these modeling or the model-based approaches are a follow-up to the routine perpetrator potential studies, that is your SIP inhibition, SIP induction, or transporter inhibition studies. Of course, it provides a great value to the sponsors in assessing this clinical potential um, through these model-based approaches, which can either totally eliminate the need for conducting a clinical DDI study. And the stepwise approach definitely brings the robustness to this prediction. And um, with that, I would like to end my today's ADME 101 talk. So thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, please um, send that to us and we will address that question. Thank you.